Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week, we try to bring you inspiring stories of people who are making the world a better place. As a Rotary Club, we are into service, service above self, service to others all over the world. And we have a special interest in, uh, in possibilities related to education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And so what you're going to do today is you're going to hear from a, a guy who is a part of a, an organization that I just personally feel very, very deeply for. I mean, this, this is one of those things that you hear a story and you're like, wait, and then you go and you check it out and, and suddenly, you know, it kind of changes something, something big in your heart. So, so I am really excited to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Edward de Aguilera, uh, product of, of Florida, I spent a time, I believe, uh, started in Orlando. You've done quite a few things across the state of Florida, but you are now the United States Chief Development Officer for Project Amigo. And I will hand it over to you to, to give us the initial presentation, and then we'll jump into Q&A. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you guys can start seeing a little bit about Project Amigo. Uh, here we go. Are we good there? Do you guys see everything? Perfect. Thank you again so much for inviting me. Um, again, my, my name is Edward Aguilera, and I, um, I do work for Project Amigo. And Project Amigo is a wonderful thing for international service. The reason a lot of people ask me, you know, why do we speak to so many Rotary Clubs? And I really, the, the reason that I, I always love talking a little bit about the story of why we speak uh, to Rotary Clubs. Then, yeah, is it not working for me? Is that, is that, there we go. It all has to do with this volcano. Um, this volcano is um, in Colima, Mexico. And in Colima, Mexico, this is called El Fuego. That's what the locals call it. So there were two Rotarians that actually were, were searching to actually find this particular volcano. And for some weird reason, they made a long, wrong turn and ended up in a little tiny town called Cofredia. Probably the first town that they saw any, any first time they had probably saw any gringos. And one of the most amazing things is that the children just kind of surrounded them. They never did make it to that uh, volcano. They fell in love with the community. They started an organization called Project Amigo. And Project Amigo is really here to empower children and empower folks uh, through the power of education, really ending the cycle of poverty. And here we can see where Colima is. It's one of the most impoverished states in Mexico. It's a tiny one right on the coast. It's a little bit north of, um, of Acapulco and a little bit south of Puerto Vallarta. So it's kind of sandwiched between these two giant tourism mecca. Well, Colima does not have that. It is an agricultural community. And you can see here's Kamala. It's right in the heart of of, of Colima, and you can see that how truly beautiful it is. But Colima is very deceptive because it truly is a place of the haves and have-nots. And these are the sick children that we serve. You can tell they are, these are the have-nots. They're migrant farmer children. They are folks that will be nomadic for most of their life, and they will go from place to place to place. This is how they live and they're happy. The one thing that I always show this picture, this picture can be heart-wrenching at times, but the one thing that I always stress is look at their faces, they're all smiling because that's their spirit, that's their passion. And these are the children that we help. Their lives are rough. Their lives can be extremely rough. And this is where they're cooking. This is, this is actually a, a good migrant farm. And by the way, they pay for the luxury of actually staying there. There's actually rent involved. So you can see why education can be an outlet, but they're not equipped for education. You know, oftentimes I was, I was asked this at the uh, conference in Toronto. I was like, you know what, Ed, Project Amigo sounds great, but education's free. I said, you know what, you are, you're right to a certain degree, but let's think, you know, kids kind of require things like paper, pencils, transportation, shoes, uniform. Unfortunately, those things aren't free. And those are just some of the things that Project Amigo offers our students. Because when they go into that classroom, we don't want them to be a standout because of their poverty. We want them to be a standout because of the brains that they have that they bring into it. These are the records that we're so proud of. And this is actually, I need to update this because we're right now at 67 university graduates. 95% of our grads are employed now. It's actually a percentage higher. Our percentage for high school students is actually higher as well. In total, we have about 771 students that are in our program. And I want you to really realize and go back to think of that original photo. Those students, that's how they start. And so we, now we have the 60 plus, almost 70 university graduates. That is not only changing their life, that is changing their life of their community. 
these are some of the areas of what we actually do with the school registrations, transportation schools, and things like that. These are all this information, by the way, is found in projectamigo.org. This is what I call the wall of fame. These are truly our graduates. These are folks that have changed, who have decided to put forth the effort with the support of the US, with the support of Canada, to actually change their trajectory of where their life is. These would have been those kids. That's who they were. This is where they study. They study at the University of Colima. And here is a, a, a nurse, she's a graduate. But the reason I always put this picture is there's something interesting about our graduates. They need three things to be part of our program. You just can't decide to be part of our program. Number one, you need to have an 8.5 GPA, and that's out of a 10. So think about it almost like a B average in our state. The other part is you also need to give 10 hours of community service because we don't want to teach these children just to be recipients of philanthropy, but we want them to understand the importance of paying it forward. The third thing is also they must have communication for their sponsor. A sponsor is an integral piece to this puzzle. Please keep in mind how these children were and how you saw where they lived and where they came. That's been generational. It's not just been their, their mother and father, but probably their grandparents and their great grandparents. So that's the world that they know. So what do these godparents do? Because that's what they call them. They call them godparents. They don't call them sponsors. They open a world for them. They create a relationship. How can a child know that they want to be an engineer when they don't even know what an engineer is? So integral. This is actually, I put this gift because this was actually supported by the Connecticut district where they actually were giving laptops to our, to our kiddos to be used in the internet cafes, which is a huge need for us because we need them to be extremely competitive when it comes to technology. These are some of the work weeks. I'm gonna kind of go through some of these slides a little bit faster. Um, these are times that you can actually come down to Colima, to Cofredia, spend a week with us and really get to know what this program and really have interaction with our children from our Literacy Week to our Christmas Fiesta Week to our Dia de los Muertos, which is coming up. Not only are you going to have this experience one-on-one -on -one with the children, but you're also gonna have some cultural experience as well and understand what this area is all about. And a lot of times people will ask me, well, Ed, I don't know the language. No, oh, don't worry about it. Sometimes we read to them, sometimes they read to us. It's amazing how the power and the spirit of the human nature when they meet together, how language is, is no longer important. And I always say not to worry, A, we have a fully bilingual staff, number one, and number two, you're going to learn some Spanish as well. Even if you don't want to, you'll understand what the word baño means at the end. Christmas fiesta is one of my favorite times. This is, uh, this picture right here is my absolute, the most imperative photo that showcases what Project Amigo is all about. So during Christmas Fiesta, our volunteers will come there. Some of them will be dressed as Santa or Santa's elves. They will decorate our area in very festive, very culturally uh, appropriate for Mexico. So you'll see a lot of piñatas and stuff. So in the gifts, what we usually give them is their uniform shoes. You know what I also call the socks and underwear of the Christmas world. But we also provide a toy. Well, this is little Ernesto. And you can see with his face, this was actually the first toy that this little boy ever received. I talked to Ernesto, this is about, was taken about six years ago. I just talked to him a couple weeks when I was visiting Mexico. He still has those models. The appreciation is there. They understand what it means to have folks come and care for them. And that's why it's so important that we, that they don't call them sponsors, they call them godparents. And the reason they call them godparents is because they have that special relationship with them. You can see some of the images of some of the things that we do during this particular week. And the reason this photo is in there with the Vija Guadalupe is because when you leave there or when you visit, it's not gonna be just understanding what Project Amigo. You're also gonna understand some cultural identity of what this area is all about. And the Vija Guadalupe is actually extremely crucial, not just to, to Colima, but to all of Mexico. This is chocolate tasting, and, and the reason I put this is because I don't want everyone to think that the only style of education has to be boring. There are many ways that we try to partake the love of education, the love of learning to our children, and we want our volunteers that come and visit us to truly understand that as well. I want to meet, there's actually two graduates that I want you guys to understand so that it really illustrates a little bit about Project Amigo and what, what, what it's all about and what it does. 
this is Miss Connie, and Miss Connie was a little firecracker of a, of a little girl, um, full of zest, full of fire. This is where Connie lived. It actually was probably a little bit better than some of the migrant farms. Unfortunately, this was further away than one of the, the migrant farms. There was no electricity or running water here. And for her to get to the bus, to take her to the bus, the school bus, it was about a two mile walk for the public bus to get her then to another bus that would take her to. So when you hear those stories that when I was young and I walked barefoot up the snow, uphill both ways, you know what, take the snow out of it because in Mexico they don't have it, but she truly did. It took her about three and a half hours each way to get to her school. And Connie, just like every other uh, young lady or young man, when they start hitting their teens, they start getting angsty. And so did Connie. And Connie was done. I'll be honest, she was ready to quit. Almost four hours out of her day, just going back and forth, and that didn't include her homework that she needed to do, her family stuff. It was tiring. And that's where her sponsors and her godparents came in and said, you know, Connie, you're too special. And we can't have you gone. Connie ended up doing pretty well for herself. She's now Dr. Connie Fonseca. And Dr. Connie Fonseca is not just a doctor, she's the medical director for rural medicine of all of Colima. So not only has she changed her life, she's changing the community's functioning of healthcare through that entire state. In addition to that, as, as she understood the importance of paying it forward, here you will see some of her brothers and sisters that she has now sponsored taking them through the University of Colima. So not only has she changed her life, she's changed her community's life and her family's life. Ercilio is another amazing guy who I just had the honor of spending the entire week with about two weeks ago. Ercilio had a little bit of a different path. He actually started school a little bit earlier, a little bit later. He had a death in the family and there was no choice. He had to go back and work. And so we worked the fields. This picture doesn't really do it justice, but if you actually ever meet him, you'll see that there's scars on his hands, on his arms. And the reason there's scars is because that's what's him pulling the sugar cane, which if you ever touch sugar cane, you can tell it's very prickly. It's amazing that this boy even decided to go back, but he decided that the importance was there. Not only did he finish his, his education, but now he's an agricultural engineer. And what I love about that is talk about full circle, from working the field to not telling the folks that own the fields how to plant efficiency, efficiently. That, my friends, is what Project Amigo is all about. These are the folks that are about just to ready to, to hit that road for success. And these little guys are just getting started. And that is a wonderful way for Project Amigo to bring international service, something tangible, something there, something ready for people to be able to come and experience and see a tangible and immediate change in the lives of these children. Thank you, guys. I hope I maintained my time limit on that. You did just fine. Thank you. Stuff. Thank you so much. All right, go ahead and, and uh, do the stop sharing there, and we'll, we'll get uh, Cecilia up as well. Uh, and so for, for all of you who are joining in on the recording, uh, other introductions, we, we've introduced our speaker. My name is Rushton Hurley. Uh, I'm a member of the programs team uh, for the E-Club of Silicon Valley. Uh, and, uh, and my good friend Cecilia Batkirk, who is, is one, of, one of the great minds of our time in our district with regard to possibilities for grants and all. And uh, Cecilia, please t take a minute and tell, you, tell a little bit about yourself as well. Um, well, actually, I am the uh, grants chair for District Rotary District 5170. And I believe that some club in our district has either contributed to a global grant in for Project Amigo or perhaps a district grant. It's been a few years, but um, I don't know if you're familiar at all with the different clubs in our district. You probably are dealing with a lot of Rotary clubs. Uh, but I've had the pleasure, and it has been an unmitigated pleasure, of serving in a group uh, on the for the Rotary Foundation called the Cadre of Technical Advisors. And I've actually reviewed projects in Mexico, the most recent of which was a project to um, help with avoidable blindness, and it was in the Hermosillo, Guaymas area, uh, on the east side of the city of Cortez. And in that area, there are many maquiladoras, and there are massive 
farming operations, all the farms are owned by American companies and the produce makes its way up here. It's all trucked up here. And so is that the situation there in Colima as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> there are a couple families, a couple Mexican families that do own large plots of lands, but you're absolutely right. The vast majority are owned by, by international. Some are U.S., some are Canadian, some are even uh, European. It's international, right. yeah. Um, one of the large producers, um, actually California based, is Organics Unlimited, uh, which does bananas. Uh, they, uh, the reason that I bring them up is because they're actually the most responsible of most of the growers there, and I would like to give them credit because they also could back to our two Project Amigo. They actually are a huge grantor for us. Um, not everyone, I can't say that the same for the other places, but that's what, uh, you know, when talking about these particular uh, producers, at least they have the responsibility and the know-how and the, the, the community service to be able to then support our organization as well. Right, right. I mean, I was struck by, in reviewing this project, how there thousands of workers are brought to the maquiladoras. I mean, as, aside from all the agriculture that goes on, and they're paid $5 a day with like no benefits. <laughs> no. And, and I mean, five I don't think there's practically anywhere in Mexico now that you can live on $5 a day. And so um, it's just, it's so unfortunate. And yet, despite all that, there is a growing middle class in Mexico. And I mean, I've traveled there many times, often many times a year for about 20 years now. So I've seen a lot of changes and I think it's really great. And I hope we can, they can keep it up with or without our help. Um, but this, these kinds of projects are just fabulous. No, and we appreciate it. And it's interesting that you mentioned about the middle class because yes, it is existed. And, and I feel like Project Amigo is actually helping by producing folks that would never have been a middle class getting up to that level. Um, it, it is an emerging, you know, it definitely is the haves and have nots. You definitely yeah. have those folks that just are extremely wealthy, and then you have folks that are just extremely impoverished. And what's interesting that you had mentioned, and, and I, I brought it up, so I just would like to share, is it is a very common practice. I mean, they're migrant, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're nomadic. So yes. some of the folks in Kalima could end up everywhere. One of the issues that we were having is around the fifth and sixth grade, it was just very common for us to lose our student. Yes. The reason? They it was now customary for them to now produce for the family. School is now um, a burden and a cost. Right. Uh, so how we kind of handled that is is when you see that list of things that we provide. Also, please add add uh, me uh, medical uh, services as well and a couple other things that we are now providing uh, certain services to the family. So now these parents look at these students as, oh my gosh, I can't lose this. You're providing health for us. You're providing excess food for us. And right. it's now an incentive. To, we incentivize that student and that parent to want them to stay. Because traditionally, you're talking about culturally, we would lose them. Um, right. And, and so slowly we're changing that. And I think that we're not the only ones doing it. I think that's being done. And that's one of the reasons I think that middle class area is emerging. And it's going to continue to emerge. Yeah, yeah, right. And I mean, I of course, what you talk about is true, not only all over Latin America, but all over the world. Kids reach the about 12 year years of age, and then the parents just cannot afford, and many of them have quite a few children, less in Mexico than other places, sure. thanks to Mexico's liberal birth control pill policy from <laughs> the 1970s or 80s, but, um, you know, so parents just could not afford the, the uniforms, books, and all the other things that kids would need for school, and so it's just tragic to see that they, in many places, they have to leave school. Um, so this is a wonderful program, and so my question is, how much does it cost to sponsor a student? The little guy started a hundred dollars a year, and then it goes for elementary. Then, uh, when we get to middle school, it is 400, high school is 600, and the most expensive is the university, and that is 4,000. Oh, yeah. Um, 
what usually happens traditionally is that someone will say, you know what, I'm interested in sponsoring. They usually will sponsor the smaller one or the a middle school, like in that 100 to 400 range. Then they start getting a relationship with that child and let's call it what it is. We want that to happen. We want you to continue supporting that child. And sometimes when we get to that level where it's 4,000, where it does become cumbersome, um, maybe the sponsor can only give one or 2,000 when we then try to pair other sponsors or sometimes clubs will come in and do a whole unity thing where it's all paid out and, 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 it, and it works out. But once you've kind of lived with your child and they've shared with you and you've shared with them, they're ready for them to be successful. And, and, and we sacrifice and we put them through, we, we put them through college. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, yeah. the whole the whole thing about connecting with the children, right? I mean, you know, you you, you mentioned the work weeks. There are these times when when people who are who are supporting a program can go down. They can take part in the programs, either for the the, the Christmas, you know, and, and getting their clothes to them. You know, the health work weeks, the reading work. Weeks, and there's a lot of different kind of opportunities to go down there and and meet them. And having been down twice myself, right? And and, and I recognize faces in your pictures, right? I met at Acleo, um, when, when, when I was there uh, last time, the right? second time that I went, uh, and I think it was Ceci in that in that first picture, you know, like the graduates, right? Um, but but you know these these are people, these are amazing people, right? I mean, you, they're, they're the people you meet, and you just think, wow, I wish I wish the world were made up of people like this because yeah. because they're they're wonderful kids, uh, they're in an environment where where they've been uh, they, they've been supported, and and you know that that opportunity to go down. And, and, you know, I think sometimes people think, oh, well, if I go down, you know, you know, where am I going to stay? I don't want to stay in one of those places. But, uh, you know, you, you should tell a little bit about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the experiences of the people. We treat in the you well. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're very lucky that we had some amazing early leadership when we first got started, and we still have some great leadership. You basically are staying in haciendas that are very well equipped and i'll be honest it's very much hotelish you will have housekeeping that will take care of and i'm very look i'm not cooking the food i'm just gonna tell you the food is amazing the food is <laughs> think of two abuelas cooking for you for breakfast lunch and dinner i mean that's basically what happens the food is absolutely out of this world and everything is tailored you know yes it's a work week i hate even calling the word work because it's it's a it's a volunteer is what it is. We understand the importance that you're giving up your time yeah. to come down there. So we need to make sure you have a good time as well. There is the part of vacation there that 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 you're going down and enjoying yourself. So we make sure that our stay that your stay is going to be extremely comfortable and that you're going to enjoy that time there. And the accommodations are great. They are most of them are owned by our board of directors. That actually that's some of their vacation homes. Well, I, I could validate that. I mean, and, and especially about the food. I mean, you know, because you pay this this amount to go, and, and 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 a lot of that money goes to supporting the program. But but you essentially you get picked up at the airport in Guadalajara or wherever it is, right? And right. you guys take care of everything from there. I mean, I, ah, it was just 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 a tremendous experience. Actually, before I just kind of keep going on about it, uh, we are kind of beginning to run down on time. So Cecilia, if you have another question or comment, feel free to take that. I do. Um, so let's see, is my, am I unmuted? Yeah. So is how much of your program is funded by Rotary Global Grants? Is, is that a big part of it or, um, and what, what expenses generally are covered in those? Okay. So uh, just to kind of know how our funding actually works, um, Global grants, it's probably actually very small as far as the global grants component, uh, maybe uh, less than 5%. Now, mm -hmm. I am trying to grow that right now. I'm right now in the middle of doing a, a global grant with the Palm Desert, a little further south of you guys, yeah. uh, uh, district over there. So we are really pushing that. I will say that about 90 some odd percent of our money comes from Rotary in some type of mechanism either through individual Rotarians or through clubs that are just have been supporting us for a year. I know that in the, well, in the Silicon, uh, I mean, you guys are in the Bay area. That's where we got started. That's our, our yeah. home. Uh, Dead and Susan were uh, right. That's, that's the, our founders. They live there in Novato. Um, so that whole San Francisco, Metro Oakland, huge area there um, does support us very 
generously with Marin and San Rafael and Chiverone and all these different clubs in all those areas. So I, that's why I wasn't surprised when you mentioned it. In our board of directors, so we have three boards of directors. That we are set up with Canada having their own board, the US having their own board, and Mexico having their own board. Mexico basically deals with the programmatic component of everything that's going in there, with the US and Canada dealing with the funding. Well, when you start looking at the boards, especially in Canada and in Mexico, um, I think that all but three are not Rotarians. And don't worry, the Rotarians there are trying to convince them to become Rotarians. So right. they're working. In addition, I'm a Rotarian. So you can see how married this world is together. It's just the roots are there. And through all the support, I, I don't see how Project Amigo would exist without the funding of Rotary in some way, shape, or form. Sure. So, so and to stay on, we're, I'm, I'm going to wind this down. I'm going to give you the last word. So if you've got kind of a, 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 a tagline that you want to share, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to give it in just a minute. But stay on so that Celia and I can keep talking to you because that's one of the big benefits of joining a recording is you get to hang out with these cool speakers that we get. So all of you who have been listening to this recording, thank you so much for joining us this week. Uh, it, is, it is our goal, as I mentioned before, every week, to find some way to inspire you, to, to remind you of the good that's being done all over the world, to connect with those people who are innovatively finding ways to, to address problems that people have, have thrown up their hands for for years trying to address. So, so it, is, it is very much our pleasure to have you join us. You are welcome to keep coming back. Right, you know, we, we have an, a wildly flexible club. You know, you, you attend sometime between Monday morning and Sunday night. Uh, you connect with uh, others via our online socials, and it's a lot of fun. Kind of like Project Mingo, it's a ton of fun. There you go, there's another theme running through this. So, we hope that you will uh, let us know you were here. There's a little, little place that you can, you can do the attendance for Ro. And, and if, if you're a visiting Rotarian and you put in your email address correctly, then you'll get an email that lets you that you can pass along to your club secretary for all of those wonderful people who maintain 100% attendance, right? You know, because you just got to get your weekly dose of inspiration from Rotary somehow. Uh, we're we're happy to uh, to be a, a good a good tool for you in that regard. Uh, and then also leave comments in our discuss section at the bottom. Uh, we, we love to see kind of the the uh, the ideas that people share about the different parts of the meeting, you know, our programs, uh, you know, our speakers, and we would like to hear from you as well. Feel free to respond what you see in in other comments, so that's how that system works. So with that, I will I will cease my rambling and hand it over to Edward for the final word. Again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come and, and join you guys. Um, thank you for helping Project Amigo. It truly is a manner of changing the cycle of poverty through education. Visit projectamigo.org, all the info's there, and please feel free to give me a call, and come visit us. I'm in Orlando. You guys can are more than welcome to visit us in sunny Florida, too. Awesome. <laughs> Everybody, we'll see you next week.